Good afternoon and welcome. I said to uh, Larry Summers, he's playing to a full house today. So welcome all. I'm Alan Solomon. I'm the Dean of the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service at Tufts University. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's forum as part of the Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series with Larry Summers, one of the nation's most distinguished economists, and one of my generation's most accomplished public servants. Before we get started, I want to thank my colleagues at Tisch College, and especially Jess Burns, for all the hard work in preparing for today's event. And I don't know if Jess is here, but give her a round of applause. She's really responsible. <laughs> I also want to thank today's co-sponsors, the Department of Economics and the International Relations Program. And you'll hear shortly from the chairman of the Department of Economics, Dan Richards. Uh, this afternoon's conversation with Larry Summers is part of the Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series, which brings to campus leaders from a variety of fields to engage with the Tufts community on important issues uh, and important public issues of the day. Since we launched the series last fall, we have hosted, among others, United States Senator Elizabeth Warren, Tufts alumnus and former United States Senator Scott Brown, the former Secretary of Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius, Boston's Mayor Marty Walsh, and just last month, and I'm sorry you missed this, Larry, but the, pers the former personal aide to President Obama, Reggie Love. Next month, on November 12th, I hope you all join us for our next speaker series event of this semester, a panel discussion on Women in Politics, featuring Congresswoman Catherine Clark, Boston City Councilor Ayanna Presley, and Massachusetts State Representative Kiko Oral. We bring these leaders to campus as part of our mission to prepare the next generation of informed and engaged students who will contribute to improving our civic life and to strengthening, if not repairing, our democracy. We combine our educational efforts with leading research on the civic and political participation of young people and with best practices to support community partnerships to promote global citizenship and to affect institutional change that will strengthen civic life. Civic life takes different forms for different people. Community organizing, in my case, and political activism. Social entrepreneurship and social innovation and research that addresses serious national and global challenges. For some, civic life is focused on their local community and its immediate surroundings, while others act on a national or international stage. Today's guest is firmly in the latter camp, having served in senior policymaking positions responsible for the fate of our nations and the world's economy. Larry Summers is the Charles W. Elliott University professor and president emeritus at Harvard University, he served as President Clinton's Secretary of the Treasury and as, President, and as President Obama's Director of the National Economic Council. Born in New Haven, Connecticut, Larry earned his Bachelor of Science in Economics at MIT and his PhD at Harvard. At the age of 28, he became one of the youngest tenured professors in Harvard's history. And as an educator and a scholar, he's made a number of notable and award-winning contributions to the field of economics. While at Harvard, Larry also began his career in public service as a staff member for President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors, and from 1991 to 1993 as the chief economist at the World Bank. In 1993, Larry joined President Clinton's Treasury Department, first as the Under Secretary for International Affairs, then Deputy Secretary, and in 1999 as the nation's 71st Secretary of the Treasury. And if you have currency that was printed in that era, then you have his autograph. During this period, he played a leading role in shaping the US response to financial crises in several countries, including Mexico, Brazil, Russia, and Japan. At home, his ten tenure at Treasury coincided with the longest period of sustained economic growth in US history. And he is the only Treasury Secretary in the last half century to have left office with the national budget in surplus. In 2001, he returned to Harvard as the university's 27th president. He led a number of major initiatives, notably removing all financial obligation from students with family incomes below $60,000 a year. 
He served until 2006 and after several years in the private sector, returned to government in 2009 as the director of President Obama's National Economic Council. Larry's wisdom and experience informed the administration's response to the financial crisis, to the failure of the auto industry, to the, and to the cascading effects on the world's economy. Using what the economist decide, defined as the Summers Doctrine, he advocated for economic policies that would combine a microeconomic laissez-faire mentality with macroeconomic activism to rein in markets. And I'm sure if he disagrees with that characterization, he will say so. When he left the National Economic Council in 2010, President Obama said, I will always be grateful that at a time of great peril for our country, a man of Larry's brilliance, experience, and judgment was willing to answer the call and lead our economic team. And as the Dean of Citizenship and Public Service, I thank you on behalf of the Tufts community for your service, Larry. In the years since, he has continued to combine his interests in business, economics, academia, and world affairs. He is the President Emeritus and Charles W. Elliott University Professor at Harvard, where he leads the university's, I may pronounce it wrong, Mosavar Ramani Center for Business and Government. He is also a committed civic leader. He chairs the boards of Citizen Schools and the Center for Global Development, and he serves on the boards of Teach for America and the education-focused Broad Foundation. He's a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, recently chaired the Commission on Global Health, which was lauded by the UN Secretary General. Perhaps more important and impressive than all of those accomplishments Larry is a father to six daughters, including Ruth, a 2012 Tufts graduate. And she has followed in her father's civic footsteps as an AmeriCorps teaching fellow and now as a special education coordinator at Citizen Schools. As a fellow Jumbo parent, I am pleased to welcome Larry Summers to his daughter's alma mater tonight. I know we all look forward to his insights about our national and global economy, insights that are informed by decades of experience at the highest level of financial and economic policy making. To lead the conversation, it's my pleasure to welcome Daniel Richards, professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Tufts University. Dan has a PhD from Yale University and is a renowned expert on industrial organization and merger analysis. He has taught at Queens University and the Sloan School of Management and has served as a consultant to the Federal Trade Commission. His most recent publication is sequential product innovation, competition, and patent policy. Please welcome Dan Richards and our distinguished speaker, Larry Summers. Welcome, Larry. Before you ask any question, uh, can I just thank you, Alan, for that? Uh, extraordinarily generous, uh, do you hear me back? Uh, for that extraordinarily generous introduction. Um, it's much better than we economists usually get. It wasn't so long ago that I was introduced by the guy who said, Larry, do you know what it takes to succeed as an economist? And I said, no. And he said, an economist is someone who's pretty good with figures, but doesn't quite have the personality to be an accountant. <laughs> that was in Moscow. And no one got the joke. <laughs> and let me just say that uh, Alan Solomont has been a friend of mine uh, for a long time. There are a certain number of people who I know who are extraordinarily decent pillars of integrity. And there are a certain number of people I know who have been very effective in partisan politics and in supporting candidates who are running for president. The only person I know who is both those things is Alan Solomon. And you are very lucky to have him as your dean uh, at Tufts. As President Obama, was very lucky to have him as his ambassador to Spain. Thank you, Alan Solomon. I, 
I think we're all in a good mood now. <laughs> so I think it's time to start the questions. I wanted to just start with uh, one simple question, because Alan has uh, uh, told us about all your civic engagement, uh, which is a big thing at the Tisch College. And you've uh, starting with, uh, well, I think you actually advised Dukakis as, uh, in his presidential quest. But you obviously were in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. You're active in civic organizations like citizen schools and so forth. And uh, a lot of economists are not. Uh, and I'm wondering what drew you to that uh, when you could have been perhaps doing more to uh, do academic research, pursue the Nobel Prize, uh, and all the things that many economists are eager to get in academia. Or gone into the private sector and made a ton of money. You know, I think that I think probably the honest answer has two parts. Um, one part is I feel like I've been very fortunate in life in many, many respects, and I've therefore felt an obligation to do what I can to make the world a better place. And as someone whose expertise is in macroeconomic analysis, I'm someone who believes that uh, a world where the unemployment rate is 5% is a world where millions more people are going to be able to fulfill their dreams than a world where the unemployment rate is 8%. And so while the interest rate and the Fed funds rate and the fiscal deficit seem like abstractions, getting them right is actually enormously important. And you can actually, in many ways, touch more lives by trying to contribute to getting macroeconomic policy better than you can as a doctor who treats an individual patient or in some other uh, way where there's more of a direct hands-on feeling, but perhaps less overall leverage than there is in economic policy. But that answer actually makes me seem more noble than I probably am. Um, a substantial part of what has drawn me into the various things that I've done is that I find them really fascinating and fun. And that I find the challenge of trying to figure out what the right economic policies are to be uh, intriguing. And so, you know, people thank me for my public service. Nobody should be thanking me for my public service. It was an enormous privilege. It was exhilarating to go to work every day as the Secretary of uh, Treasury. It's an opportunity that a huge number of people would like to have and that I was fortunate enough to have. So I'm happy to celebrate public service, but people shouldn't be celebrating me for some kind of sacrificial uh, behavior. I was doing things, I was thinking about things that I found fascinating. I was with people who I found enormously stimulating and satisfying uh, to uh, be with. And I was having an opportunity to make a difference, which is what all of us uh, want. So I can describe it in terms of an obligation I felt to public service, and that is true. but. I also felt just a desire to do what was captivating and exciting uh, for me. And that was also a very important part of the career choices that I've made. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the choices in that career that, that you made, or maybe some of the analyses that you uh, would have done or could have done differently. Looking back to the 2007-2008 onset of the crisis and the Great Recession, what do you think were the ultimate causes, or the foundational causes of that? You know, questions like that <laughs> can be answered on many different levels. If you ask, like, what caused World War I, there's a kind of analysis which talks about a rising Germany and a complacent England. And there's another kind of analysis that talks about the misunderstanding of the German foreign ministry and the miscommunication with the British foreign ministry 
in the wake of the assassination of the Archduke. And those aren't quite alternatives. They're sort of explanations at a different level. And I think you have to kind of recognize that when you talk about the financial crisis. At uh, a most basic and sort of macro level, um, I went to Davos in January of 2007, and my line was, the main, obviously drawing from Roosevelt, was the main thing we have to fear is the lack of fear itself. What I meant by that was after a long period of economic success that economists had called the great moderation, everybody was complacent, and that complacency is a self-denying prophecy. It's a self-denying prophecy because it leads people to borrow too much money. It leads them to spend unsustainably. It leads them to overinvest. And when you get those things, you then create a great deal of vulnerability. So at the broadest level, I think the answer was complacency that was born of great economic performance. It's number one. I think the second thing um, is that we had an inadequately regulated uh, financial system. Um, that was born of the fact that no financial institutions particularly had failed. Banks had done fine. Everybody kind of thought the financial system was OK. And so regulators ignored a whole set of warning signs. The fact that bank stocks were collapsing probably should have told people that there was something going wrong badly in the banking sector and that more capital as reserve need to be, needed to be mobilized. But essentially, that, didn't, that wasn't forced by regulators to any substantial uh, extent. We had allowed a system that was kind of in two parts. We regulated heavily banks, and we didn't regulate heavily other financial institutions. And so guess what? Water finds a way. Um, through the dam, and so activity had moved outside of what we were heavily regulating into various parts of the shadow banking system that we were regulating in much less satisfactory ways. So I would say failure of financial regulation, which to my mind took the form much more of not using regulatory powers that the regulators had available to them, then it did some deep and profound failure in terms of whether regulators had powers, um, was, I think, a second major contributor to it. And then you can answer the question. It's, so that's, those are sort of two levels of explanation. One, a kind of broad macro explanation. Another, uh, in terms of sort of what public policies might have avoided uh, the crisis. Another level of explanation would say that Lehman was allowed to fail. And there's a great debate as to whether there was no legal alternative to letting Lehman fail or whether a different choice could have been made. But in any event, Lehman was allowed to fail. And that was like throwing a match in a very dry forest. And a situation that was very serious and troubling went to a sort of Armageddon-ish uh, place where GE was not able to borrow money for five-day periods but had to rely on two-day loans in the immediate aftermath of the failure of Lehman. So the mishandling whether because of the lack of a legal framework or because of a bad choice of Lehman is a third level of explanation for what caused the financial crisis. A fourth level of explanation would trace a variety of kinds of financial problems, in particular the uh, various factors that led to the housing bubble and that led to the substantial amount of subprime mortgage debt that was held by people 
who were holding it with very substantial leverage, which led to a margin spiral where when the debt went down in value, people who held it but held it, having borrowed a lot of money in order to hold it, had to sell it, which sent it down further, which created a kind of uh, death spiral. So I think all of those are different levels of explanation that contribute to understanding what caused the financial crisis. And as my World War, II, World War I example suggested, they're, they're more complementary than they are opposing kinds of explanation. So this is a academic -y kind of a question, but it goes back to some of the things that I read by Larry Summers a long time ago. One was uh, a piece that I think is well known that challenged the efficient markets hypothesis and that said noise, trad noise traders and so forth would make it difficult for arbitrageurs to really do their job and police uh, securities prices in even well uh, or organized markets. And another piece uh, was a piece that I remember, and I can't remember exactly when this came out, but I would have thought it was in the late 80s, early 90s, that said preparing something about for the next crisis and it outlined a scenario that looked like overconfidence, building a bubble building and then collapsing and that that could happen and what, how we should be, be prepared for doing it. So that's the side of Larry Summers that I was familiar with in some ways that, that, that warned about the failure of, of uh, financial markets and the potential for a real financial collapse. Uh, I think it was actually written in the wake of the 87, uh, you know, 500 point drop in the stock market. Then there is another side of Larry Summers that I think is in the popular mind that associated with in the Clinton administration with deregulation and or at least failure to uh, uh, regulate the uh, uh, derivatives market or to push for der derivative market regulation and uh, also with uh, uh, support for what finally happened, namely the uh, end of the Glass-Steagall Act and uh, and so there's a side of Larry Summers that I think is in the public eye that seems to be uh, less uh, <clears throat> prudential about the, the possibilities of financial crisis and so forth. I'm wondering two things. Why didn't, was there, was there a conflict there or, uh, or, or at least why wasn't the story about the Larry Summers that worried about financial market failure a lot and worried about the crisis that it might lead to come through and, and looking back to it in that same vein, would you have done anything differently or recommended policies differently in the 1990s in the Clinton era? knowing what we do know now about what followed in the, in the decade after. So there were a lot of parts to that question. Yeah, I, I know. I'm only gonna <laughs> and I'm only going to respond to a few of them. Um, I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze why the press leaves the impressions that it, that it leaves. You know, nobody's, a fair nobody's a fair judge of uh, their own press. I think the more, most important part of your question is what about the 1990s, and was it somehow inconsistent with my skepticism about the efficiency of uh, financial markets? I don't, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, we would have legislated something like Dodd-Frank in 1999, and we would have known that there was going to be a financial crisis coming, and we would have put in place the set of things that were put in place after the financial crisis to prevent crises like that. And we didn't have that kind of, uh, we didn't have uh, that kind of foresight. I wish we did. I think I can honestly say that uh, nobody else much watching the situation had that kind of foresight either. I think it's a sort of gross oversimplification to frame these things as deregulation is good, is bad, regulation is good. If you did something that was deregulatory, you made a mistake. If you did something that was regulatory, you're a hero. Without looking at what the actual substance of the things are. And so when I looked at these issues as Treasury Secretary, and before that as Deputy Treasury Secretary in the 90s, I saw some things that I thought were serious problems that called for more regulation, and I saw some things that I caught, thought were issues that called for less regulation. I thought predatory lending for mortgages was a big problem. And Andrew Cuomo and I 
wrote a major report arguing that that needed to be cleaned up, the Republican Congress wouldn't go near it. We tried, but there was just no, no appetite for that with the Republican Congress. I argued that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, the so-called government-sponsored enterprises, were major accidents waiting to happen, but there was no appetite for it. The uh, Republicans thought they were capitalism and we shouldn't regulate companies, and the Democrats thought they were slush pots that could be used to support various kinds of low-income housing programs, and that if they were regulated more, they'd have less profits, and that would mean less money for low-income housing programs. And so there, was no, there wasn't much political constituency. We did achieve some minor strengthening of their regulation and capital position, but it was fairly minor because they basically had built a formidable phalanx of political support. And, but we warned about the government-sponsored enterprises, and I think looking back, we were very much right about that. We did, um, and I would defend this decision to this day, uh, support the repeal of Glass-Steagall. We did that, for those, of, for those people, a few people in this room who probably studied finance, would you rather write a put on a portfolio or would you rather write a portfolio of puts? Separating financial institutions into a lot of small parts, any one of which could go bankrupt, arguably increases risk to the government rather than reduces risk to the government. More fundamentally, the basic idea, which was that banking and investment banking could be combined, had already happened. Citibank had merged with Solomon Brothers before we got near Glass-Steagall. So it had really happened. So what our legislation did was codify a framework for dealing with the reality that it had emerged. There was not a single transaction that took place between 1988 and 2008, 1998 and 2008, that would not have been legal under previous law. So the idea that this was somehow the cause of the financial crisis is, I think, at the edge of absurd. And if you think about the institutions you associate with the financial crisis, Bear Stearns, pure investment bank, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Lehman Brothers, likewise. AIG, insurance company, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Fannie Mae, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Freddie Mac, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Wachovia, big bank, no investment bank, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Washington Mutual, similarly, not touched by uh, Glass-Steagall. So if you look, I think it's very hard to relate anything about Glass-Steagall to anything that happened with respect to the financial crisis. And I think in general, you shouldn't regulate unless you have a reason uh, to regulate and you're regulating effectively. So I would defend that decision. I think the case with uh, derivatives is more complicated. Sure, it's true that if we had seen everything that was coming, we never would have done uh, the law that was passed in 1999. On the other hand, there were huge numbers of authorities that were open to people to regulate derivatives between 2001 and 2008 that were not taken. So if people, don't use, if people didn't use regulation, regulatory authority five through 10, it's a little hard to believe that taking away regulatory authority 11 through 13 was really very important with respect to what caused the crisis. And the reality is, and nobody, yeah, and the reality is that um, the particular kinds of derivatives that were relevant during the financial crisis were either non-existent or in their infancy when the Clinton administration left office. And so I am haunted by the question of whether we could have done something differently that would have prevented this and 
perhaps with more foresight, we would have been able to see the whole apparatus that was going to evolve and call for doing something uh, to prevent it. On the other hand, I, I comfort myself with the sense that there were a lot of authorities that we left behind that weren't used, that the appetite with Phil Graham as the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee and Alan Greenspan as the chairman of the Federal Reserve for more regulation was, uh, very, very lim was very, very limited. So now the crisis has hit. It's 2008, you're advising a new presidential campaign and later to become the head of the National Economic Council. And the crisis is here, it's beginning to filter into the real sector with a downturn in, in production and a rise in unemployment. And you've got to make some choices and about what you're going to recommend to the new incoming president, what policies they should, they should follow. And do you think we ended up doing the right thing? Do we, should we, fiscal policy have been more stimulative? Was it politically possible to make it more stimulative? Was monetary policy on course uh, or on sufficient course early on? And, and in general, what sort of macroeconomic policies were you thinking at the time and looking back, do you think they were the right ones again? If you look at any interesting economic statistic from the fall of 2008 through the winter of 2009, it is worse than from the fall of 1929 to the spring of 1930. And what happened bears no resemblance to the Great Depression. If you look at the American moment of maximum crisis was September, of 2000, September October of 2008, the moment when the economy turned upwards was June of 2009. That's nine months. If you compare that nine month interval with the corresponding interval in Europe, or the corresponding interval in uh, Japan, it is far, far shorter. So looking both at past US historical experience and the experience of other countries that have had financial crises, I think you have to make the broad judgment that we did quite well, uh, that we engineered a turn much more quickly. And that was because we made a couple of basic philosophical judgments. One was better to do too much than to do too little. Let's try as much fiscal policy as we can. Let's try as much monetary policy uh, as we can. Let's stand as strongly behind the financial system uh, as we can. Second, we made a judgment, and Tim Geithner pushed this judgment very hard, and he was, and history has vindicated him. We made a judgment that you had to make a decision in dealing with the financial system, whether your overriding goal was going to be vengeance or confidence. That there was a strong case for moral case for vengeance. These institutions had failed to control their risks, and their failure to control risks was having huge adverse consequences for large numbers of uh, people who had, no, who had uh, no clue what JPM stood for. On the other hand, you also had to make a judgment that the basic function at this moment was to restore confidence in the financial system and to maintain the flow of credit, and that Vengeance against people is really a very poor way to restore their confidence or to restore other people's confidence in them. And so a judgment was made that yes, there would be accountability, but the overriding imperative was the restoration of confidence and confidence in the financial system. And those two judgments, do too much, restore confidence, and do those things within the limit of what was politically feasible. That was the basic strategy we adopted. That was the essence of what um, Alan Solomon was kind enough to call the Summers Doctrine. And I think those judgments have panned out, and I would recommend them to people if, God forbid, they find themselves caught in another financial crisis. Now, battlefield medicine is uh, never uh, perfect, would 
it have been better if a larger fiscal program could have passed through the Congress? Yes, but the Obama administration couldn't even get as large a program as it asked for. So I don't think there was a lot of scope there uh, to uh, do better. Are there questions that can be asked about the design of the different bailouts with respect to the financial institutions? Yeah, in retrospect, you can ask questions whether taxpayers could have driven a harder, could have uh, driven a harder uh, bargain uh, in some ways. And, you know, I think those are reasonable arguments. But if you look at the thing in its fullness and you go back to the fact that you were looking at a depression era collapse and you were looking at a vastly sooner vastly faster recovery than anybody else has ever had with respect to a problem of that magnitude, I think you have to give the post-crisis handling uh, high grades. And I think as part of that, you have to give the two presidents of the United States who were prepared to stand behind Ben Bernanke, who was a technocrat, prepared to stand behind Hank Paulson, prepared to stand behind uh, Tim Geithner, very, very great credit. So let's continue on, just being up to the, we've gone through the crisis now, we're coming out, life is turning good, but it's not so good for middle Americans who are seeing their wages and salaries not really growing, as the median uh, wage so flat, and, and there's widening income disparity and as David Autorius suggested, a hollowing out of the American middle class. And even though the unemployment rate down is at 5.1%, we know that a number of people have just dropped out of the labor force and are sort of quasi-unemployed in a way that seems to be a worrisome trend. So does that worry you? As you are you worried about this, the hollowing out or the pressures on the American middle class and the uh, continued pressures or workings in our labor market which seem not to be translating productivity gains into wage increases and salary increases for the middle Americans or the working Americans? I think the failure you describe of the economy to produce better results for the middle class is the defining problem for the United States from which most of our other problems follow. The dysfunctional politics of the Tea Party, Donald Trump, and gridlock results heavily from middle class frustration and anger and a lurching towards non-establishment alternatives. The disturbing sense that many around the world have of America turning inwards and not being prepared to play its traditional role of underwriting the global system goes back, I think, crucially to frustrated citizens uh, at, uh, at home. So if the question is, does it worry and alarm, does it worry and alarm me? Yes, it, is, it seems to me the economic problem that dwarfs all other economic uh, problems uh, facing the United States. Like most economic problems, I don't think it has a single silver bullet uh, solution. If we ran a higher pressure economy in which there was um, more jobs seeking fewer workers rather than more workers seeking fewer jobs, it would lead to better treatment of workers, better conditions for workers, better higher wages uh, for workers. And that's why I think continuing to support demand in the economy is so essential. And that's why I've been very clear that until and unless there's much stronger evidence of inflation than I've yet seen, I think the Fed tightening rates um, would be a, poli would be a uh, policy error. Um, and I think there's a strong case for the use of fiscal policy, particularly to uh, invest in uh, infrastructure. I mean, get this. We have a zero interest rate. 
we have materials costs that are extraordinarily low because of what's happened to commodity <coughs> prices. We have huge unemployment and non-employment among less educated men. There is no better time to fix LaGuardia and Kennedy airports. We have less infrastructure investment as a share of GDP, once you take out depreciation, than we have any time since the Second World War. And federal infrastructure investment on a net basis is now actually zero. That is, depreciation equals all the new uh, investment. It doesn't make any sense, and fixing it would put people to work in the short run, create high quality jobs in the short run, and expand the economy's capacity in the medium run. So we need to do much more with fiscal and monetary policy. We need to do things to address inequality, more progressive, more progressive taxation, stronger and more appropriate uh, regulation to raise the minimum wage, to enforce uh, labor laws in a reasonable way, to enfranchise workers to have a share uh, in uh, profits. Um, we are going to be, the next generation of Americans is going to be the first generation of Americans that wasn't better educated than their parents. And that can't be the right way forward. So there's a lot that can be done. And there's no, you know, my favorite quotation in many ways for thinking about public policy is uh, John Kennedy's observation that man's problems were made by man it follows that they can be solved by man. So I have a lot more questions to ask you, uh, including about inflation and deflation. But as you know, inflation and deflation has special meaning here in New England. So I'm going to avoid that topic uh, altogether and just turn it over to uh, uh, ask for questions from the, from the guests here. Uh, anybody wants to ask uh, Larry Summers a question about the economy? Or anything else. <laughs> I think, we, I think we formed an impression of what normal was that was significantly exaggerated in the 2004, 2005 period. And I'm not sure we're ever going to see anything like that again. And I think I'd worry if we did see something like that again. I think that there are some real issues of availability of credit for people who if you're poor, it's OK. And if you're rich and credit worthy, it's OK. If you're kind of in between, the pendulum may have swung too far towards not giving people uh, enough uh, credit. I think that's something that's holding back uh, the housing market a bit. I suspect that there's some, something cultural going on where more people are going to be comfortable renting, and there's going to be a little less desire for the full degree of commitment that comes uh, from owning a, owning a home. You know, I think there's been a, a sea change in tastes. I haven't seen the study done, but my suspicion is that if you look at the relative price of a house on half an acre in Lexington versus an apartment in the South End, I think there's been a pretty dramatic change over the last gen over the last generation, and so some of that I think is probably not you know who knows what will happen eventually, but I don't I don't think housing is going to come back to be uh, the way uh, be the way it was. Alan has a question. Um, since I can't ask you an intelligent question about economics, I want to ask you about it. We've seen uh, people who've been invited to speak on college campuses, like Christine Lagarde, disinvited. Um, we've seen some troubling signs about you know, civil uh, dialogue uh, in the academy. And there was an article in the Washington Post about uh, a former or a supporter of Israel who's decided to boycott Israel. Could 
This is something that's very important to me, going back to my time as uh, a university president, and something where I'm very distressed about where thing about where things are. Your question actually combined two quite separate issues. Um, the first principle I would assert is that universities ought to be places where any idea can be expressed, that nothing should be unutterable or undebatable on university campuses, and that when the pressure of the crowd leads to the censoring of speakers, the failure to represent points of valid and significantly held points of view, or the disindentation of speakers who have been invited, something deplorable has happened. And I think that has happened when Smith College um, disinvited the head of the IMF because a certain number of people at Smith thought the IMF were imperialists. You know, let them require that there be a question period where these issues can be debated. But to invite and to disinvite is, I think, badly wrong. When, when Rutgers University disinvited uh, Condoleezza Rice, when Brandeis University disinvited Ion Hurst Ali, I may or may not have agreed with those various speakers, but once they have been invited, to disinvite them is to deny what academic institutions are about. And I might also say that I think there is a broader problem of diversity. I am a big believer in diversity in all of its forms. But one of the forms of diversity that I think is important is ideological diversity. And on too many campuses, there is too much reluctance to give full, I don't share them, but there is too much reluctance to give full airing to conservative or religious uh, points of view, and it is a real problem. Then there is a second problem, second issue, which you touched on with your Washington Post question, which is universities need to be places where all views can be expressed. But it is essential that it be understood, one, that academic freedom does not include freedom from criticism, and that if a view is thought to be offensive or wrong, that people are free to debate and challenge and even ridicule that point of view. And two, that no one should have the right to instrumentalize the university to support their particular political point of view. And that's why the notion of divestment um, or the notion of academic boycotts seems to me so profoundly offensive. And the idea in particular, referencing that article, that somehow Israel is so uniquely guilty of some set of sins that the world's universities should um, be willing to not invest in any company that does business with Israel, or that universities should, as Tufts University is, remain a member of the American, as Harvard University is, remain a member of the American Studies Association, even though the American Studies Association has announced its intention to boycott Israel, seems to me to be badly, uh, uh, badly wrong and misguided. So I think that it's a very difficult set of balances involved in academic freedom 
with, on the one hand, tolerance being a central value, and on the other hand, there needs to be an absolute stand against instrumentalizing the university in support of particular political objectives, and especially when the thinking behind those political uh, objectives is uh, shallow and, mis uh, shallow and uh, misguided. And so I am quite troubled by the fact that the responses to the American, Universe, American Studies Association boycott have largely taken the form of a kind of general criticism of boycotts without a recognition of the particularly offensive uh, character that comes from one that is targeted and selective towards a state that is associated with one religion and one ethnicity. I saw a question here, right there. Oh, I, in the fullness of it, I got huge amounts of satisfaction out of my time as, uh, as president of Harvard. Um, and I particularly loved the opportunities that one had as president of Harvard uh, to interact uh, with uh, students. Frankly, I found relating to uh, some components of the faculty uh, to be extraordinarily difficult. And that might have been my failing, or it uh, might have been uh, their uh, feeling. I felt that it was very important in a world that was changing extremely rapidly uh, that Harvard change rapidly on questions like equality of opportunity, on questions like reforming its curriculum, on questions like using digital technology, on questions like rearranging the way it dealt with uh, interdisciplinary research uh, in, uh, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the sciences. And I felt it was important that the university move very quickly to respond to the imperatives of the moment. And, you know, my experience uh, was uh, that faculty were heavily, many faculty were heavily governed by a sense of tradition and prerogative and didn't want the status quo uh, to be challenged. Many of them experienced uh, me as overconfident and in too much of a hurry. And there was a lot of tension uh, around all of it. And those parts of the, those parts of the experience uh, were, much, uh, were much less pleasant. And, you know, everybody can have, different people will have different views as to uh, where the merits uh, lie. But in the fullness of it, I think universities are in many ways because they have a chance to change people during what are the most malleable stage in their life uh, between the ages of 18 and their early 20s. And because they're the source of ideas and ideas are ultimately what drive the world, I think they're immensely important and positive institutions. And I was uh, very honored and thrilled to lead uh, one of the most important uh, universities, even if it also involved experiences that were as frustrating as any I've had during my career. So let me, so did you have a question? Uh, you had a question. Uh, oh, you did. Leave 
leaving Harvard uh, because I think that they seemed to me the faculty was looking for a way to get rid of it. So I said something that was very carefully phrased about the boycott. I said that it was, I said that a boycott, uh, a divestment by a major university like Harvard would be anti-Semitic in effect, if not intent. Because it seemed to me that if you, that nobody would question that if you divested all the stocks in an African country, and you couldn't explain why you had chosen an African country to divest rather than another country, it would immediately be regarded as racist. And it seemed to me that if you divested Israel and you couldn't explain why, why Israel, not other countries with much greater, um, much greater sins, it would be seen as anti-Semitic to oppose the Jewish state in that way. But I chose the words, in effect, if not intent, because I wasn't prepared to make a judgment that all the people who were advocating it were anti-Semites or were proposing an anti-Semitic action. To be absolutely clear, I would stand by that judgment today and I would not withdraw one inch uh, from that judgment. Was that the reason why I had so much controversy uh, with the faculty at Harvard? I'm sure, it con I'm sure it contributed, but there were a lot of issues where I took strong positions and I would defend the strong positions I took, but I, wouldn't, I think it would be a mistake to ascribe the magnitude of the controversy to any single issue. We have time for at least one more. There's one way here in the center. Why don't you take two or three and let me yeah. answer them as okay, a group right, that's good. so more so people can do it. There, there, and then someone from here. Uh, about, I'm trying to call non-economists so, uh, back there at that table. So first, second, third. Want to answer them? You want to get them all in? Let me get them all in. Then. So your sure. second. Like take as many, second. take a few, okay. and, that, and I'll, okay. that way you'll so get more. One, two, more people get them. And those, was that a step? Right over there. That's good. So you're, you're next. Say your question. Uh, sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm a senior here at Tufts. Uh, thank you for coming in today. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't think would be a question I asked, but it has a lot more to do with Tish Civic uh, spirit. So I'm going to ask you, but. Uh, in, in your discussion, you kind of discussed, you talked about how uh, the frustration of sort of the middle class citizen diluted that trust in sort of the global uh, system, the global network underpinned by America. Um, I, worked, I worked in Holland this summer where a, a report was produced called The Crisis on Global Governance, um, and it suggested that local organizations uh, and local people should really get more involved in sort of bringing back that trust in the global system and network. Um, so I was curious to hear what you would think uh, as to what the average citizen can do, um, maybe beyond their traditional role of voting uh, and building, rebuilding JFK, which it desperately needs, and a bridge between New Jersey and New York would be nice. Um, but, <laughs> But, uh, got it. Yeah. Um, so. Right there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was curious to hear what your thoughts are on China, whether you think that the, the financial turmoil has been stemmed there, whether you see it as a, as a longer term and potentially very uh, you know, disruptive process or process in where you just get their sort of I think that's, that's probably going to wrap, wrap it okay. up those three. China, uh, uh, China, I think we're probably in the third or fourth inning of their economic difficulty. I think they've got big challenges of 
adjustment to demography, to uh, huge overinvestment, to huge overinvestment. You know, China put more, China laid more cement and concrete between 2011 and 2013 than the United States did in the 20th century. Um, think about that. Uh, and they've got complicated political challenges of maintaining legitimacy while at the same time resisting corruption. So I, I think that China's got remarkable leaders. They've got huge strengths. But I think it's going to be a much more difficult next decade for them uh, than it was in the last uh, decade. Um, trust. Uh, I think that part of the answer, look, I, I hope every tough student takes a semester abroad, or if they don't take a semester abroad, they take part of a summer abroad. And I think that in terms of building international trust, just more people living in places for significant intervals that are different than where they started makes a big contribution. You know, there was uh, an old idea when I was a kid, which was pen pals. You set up pen pals and you wrote letters with people from other countries um, who you were introduced to for the purpose of kind of forging connections. Well, I don't know what the digital equivalent of pen pals exactly is, but it seems to me somebody ought to figure one out and ought to do it in a significant scale and there ought to be much more communication. Uh, one of the more interesting graphs I've seen recent, uh, recently was of the fraction of people's Facebook friends who were in different countries. And that's going way up. And I think that's a very, I think that's a very uh, important uh, thing. I think what's most important and exciting about uh, digital, uh, uh, digital technology is, um, is that the world's knowledge is now available to the world. You know, it used to be that huge numbers of people came to Harvard to like use the Harvard libraries. Now, you can be in a rainforest in Tanzania and you can essentially get all the information that there is in the Harvard uh, libraries. It used to be that it was an extraordinary privilege to get to come and sit in certain classes. Now, those classes, you can be a genius ninth, a genius ninth grader in, um, in, a village in, in a village in rural India, and you can get the same kind of training in physics that you can get at, uh, Lexington, at Lexington High. So I think that what digital technology can do to spread knowledge and make the world both more comprehending, which is an intellectual value, and more understanding, which is a much broader value, I think is a thing that has uh, staggering possibility uh, associated with it. And I think the question for universities, like Tufts, is are they basically going to drive that? Or are they basically going to keep doing what they do while other people uh, drive that? And it's going to take a lot of courage, a lot of boldness, a lot more reluctance to stick with tradition uh, than universities, at least in the United States, are accustomed to if they're going to be drivers of the change that I think is possible to huge benefit. say that um, you cannot ex come and hear and meet Larry Summers if you do it digitally. So you have to come to the Tisch Distinguished Speaker Series. So on behalf of Tisch College and Tufts University, 
Larry, I want to thank you very much. I thank all of you for joining us. Uh, I want to remind you that on November 12th, we'll have a program on women in politics. I'm, I'm talking for a moment because I'm looking for the prop that I'm supposed to be given. Not, oh, oh. Sorry, my stage manager. So I, we, we, all, we have a tradition of, uh, of presenting gifts to our speakers. And, and if I may um, take the liberty, first of all, on behalf of a friend of mine who wrote this book, which is The History of the Federal Reserve Bank, Roger Lowenstein. Oh, thank you very much. He's a dear friend who signed it for you. So that's, it's a great book. It's called uh, America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. There was a, there was a, um, a book review by Bob Rubin, a close friend of Larry Summers in the New York Times yesterday. So that's the first gift. That has nothing to do with Tufts, unfortunately. But Roger will come in the spring and talk about his book. But as it Tufts, Dad, we wanted, to, we wanted to give you some things for the golf course to keep the sun out of your eyes. So here you go. So I wanted to make sure that you had some tough swag. There we go. To go along with your crimson. There we go. 